Via telephone, the House Judiciary Chair and candidate for governor, Moore Capito, joins us. Moore, good morning. Thanks for being with us. Good morning, Rob. Glad to be with you guys this morning. That was a uh, heck of a ball game. It was, but did we sound like two old men crabbing about the pregame show just now, Moore? You know, I'm going to be candid with you, Rob. I was actually out shooting hoops with the kids until about kickoff, so I didn't catch most of the... uh, I did not catch most of the, the pregame, so I'm going to have to take your word on that one. You are the smartest man in the room then because I, <laughs> I put off tuning in till about 6-ish. Uh, once the puppy bowl ended, actually. This, like, <laughs> how, did that one, how did that one wind oh, up? I, I didn't catch that on the news. Team Ruff was down, I think, 73-42 to 42 late and rallied to win in overtime 87-83. Until number 47 got an itch. And then it had to be taken care of. <laughs> That'll happen. So it's an injury on the field. If you had team rough, you won. If you had, if you gave it the three points, you still covered. You're good. Uh, more. Speaking of covering, let's take a look at this uh, tax plan that the Senate has sent your way, and uh, obviously very different from what the House and the governor had uh, approved previously. Uh, your thoughts as you viewed the Senate plan. Absolutely. The Senate plan came over last week. Uh, it was obviously very well thought of. I think I should probably start by saying what, what an incredible moment generally uh, in the state of West Virginia when we're talking about tax relief. Uh, and that's, uh, that's got to happen for the people of West Virginia. There's no doubt that um, coming out of this session, we have to get something done. And I think that the Senate's plan uh, is a suggestion or a really good step in that direction. I, I, uh, I think that, you know, given the governor's uh, remarks to it, uh, he was accepting of it. I've, I've, I've had some conversation with the finance chair and some of the leadership, and, and they think it's, a, they think it's a, a plan that we can really get down the road on. I mean, of course, it's a little bit different. You said it was drastically different. I mean, again, we're talking about tax relief, so it's a great thing. Uh, it's just a question of uh, where those buckets are going to uh, catch the cuts. So one thing that when we spoke with the leader householder mentioned was the amendment to revisited by the Senate in the form of rebates being sent out for personal property taxes being paid, the car tax, uh, for instance. And he seemed to indicate that that might be a non-starter in the House. Are you amenable to working that in? I think that it was pretty well understood uh, throughout sort of the debate that came into November and then after that the car tax was a uh, an important piece to many West Virginians. Obviously, the difficulty anytime you have rebates, you just hope that everybody takes full advantage of them and that you have the manpower to sort of to work them through. Uh, ultimately, I, I don't know if a a rebate structure is going to be what is uh, settled on. But I think um, the most important thing is to get as many tax dollars as we can back into the pockets of hardworking West Virginians. Do we have the infrastructure in place to handle a rebate? You know, suddenly hundreds of thousands of people are sending in their, their request for a rebate. Well, that would obviously be a question for the tax department, but I, you know, I think that is where some of the concern is. Uh, obviously, this legislature has passed initiatives before where um, we've sort of called on government to step up uh, the staffing and step up the, you know, productivity, and 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 largely, those those individuals and those groups and those departments have met the call. So I'm sure whatever is ultimately decided upon um you know the state of west virginia will execute but 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 in no way does that mean that it it wouldn't be a difficult task administratively so do you feel a little bit like the goalposts keep moving to continue with the football analogies here that uh at one point we wanted to make a big splash and at one point we were talking about the the senate wanted to have a 50 percent cut out of the box, and we've gone from 100, excuse me, 1.4 billion, I think, soft numbers, back to the the taxpayers, and now we're talking about 600 million back to the pa- taxpayers. We've gone to 15 percent income tax cut from 50 percent tax cut. It just seems to me that that people keep changing their minds. What are your thoughts? 
you know, it's part of the process. I, you know, the field goal post may have moved last night on that one field goal, I suppose. But, um, you know, I, I think it's probably part of the process. I, I know that the Senate, and of course I can't speak for them, but they had interest in sort of uh, broadening the uh, or increasing the number of buckets that we touch with this relief. I know that the House obviously was squarely focused on personal income tax. Uh, I'd like to see you know, some a, a little more increase on the income tax side of it to ensure that, you know, West Virginians are benefiting uh, most. Everyday West Virginians are benefiting most and getting back uh, a large part of this surplus that they're responsible for. Yeah, I'm just concerned that when, when the concern is attracting more people and more businesses to West Virginia, um, a 50 percent cut is is newsworthy and and would draw attention. This is just so convoluted with so many moving parts. I'm not sure that it account, it accomplishes the marketing goal of attracting outsiders into the state. I don't disagree with that. You, you certainly don't want to lose the effect and the power that that splash is going to have. And if you, and it, and it doesn't mean in necessarily in actual uh, implemented impact, it may not have a, you know, somewhat of a, of a similar effect, but, but I agree with you. I mean, we've got a, the governor's been bold here. He stepped out. I applaud his leadership. He wants to make a splash. He's been um, on this personal income tax thing for quite some time now. Uh, I think the people of West Virginia uh, are favorable to it. And quite frankly, I think that they deserve it. More capitos. Our guest, go ahead, John. Did you have a follow up? I just curious. The difference between 1.4 billion and 600 million is pretty significant. It is significant, but it was it was interesting John, when you were when you were mentioning both of those numbers. I was like, wow. I mean, that those are big numbers in the state of West Virginia to talk about. I mean, six hundred million. I mean, going over a billion, of course. Um, but I, I have uh, full confidence that we'll find something uh, and get something done somewhere in between there. I, I would suspect. I don't know that, but generally, that's kind of what happens at the end of the day. You find a number in between. Um, and get down the road. But I'm, I'm hopeful that, that we'll have a very, very meaningful personal income tax relief for the people of West Virginia, which, again, I think is the most important. And to your point, uh, that's a news story that's going to have a ripple effect, uh, not only within the state, but regionally as well, and, and perhaps even nationally. More Capito is the Judiciary Chairman in the House of Delegates. He's also a candidate for governor in the state of West Virginia. And more in watching the Friday proceedings, uh, local delegate Bill Ridenauer, who's from nearby Jefferson County, expressed a great deal of concern about this form energy deal going on in the northern panhandle, uh, or close to it, I guess. And uh, well, I guess you know, that would be the northern panhandle, Brook, and, and such. So uh, mm -hmm. the mood of the House did not seem to be, go along with Bill's concerns. It, it seemed like most of the House is okay with this deal. What are your thoughts on it? First, let me say Bill's been wonderful. He, he's on uh, this committee here, and he is an inquisitive. He is a super hardworking guy and really smart. Uh, it's been a real joy to, to, to get to sort of work with him so far. There were there were passionate debates on the floor last week, certainly with this form energy deal. We have a community in Weirton, uh, West Virginia, that obviously was impacted with the departure of, of, of the steel industry. We have land there that is primed for development. And we have a company that wants to invest in the state of West Virginia to the tune of 750 jobs. And so I look at it somewhat, I don't want to be overly simplistic, but we're talking about an area that is uh, in need of an economic sort of shot in the arm. They've got a great community, but they've got this, this perfect plot of land that can be developed for a company that it seems committed to the state of West Virginia. I voted in favor of it. I think that, uh, you know, that as far as economic development is concerned, that's, that's our number one objective is to try to get more jobs and more employers into the state of West Virginia. And at the end of the day, I think what West Virginians want, what I've heard, what West Virginians want, they want 
government and they want the legislature when it relates to the economy to either get out of the way or help foster a better a sort of breeding ground for a good economy. And I think that's what we did on Friday. I think in a perfect world where everything is equal, that it should not be the role of government to give money to private companies in, in any form or fashion, whether it's to build a stadium for the local football team or to buy buildings so that a, a company can, can move into town or give them tax breaks to move into town for a few years to be able to, to do business. However, it's not a perfect world. And if you don't do that, then the folks right across the border from you will. So you're forced to, in that situation, spend a little bit of money to hopefully make some money back. Some people are fundamentally opposed to that. It sounded like Bill was. And others are like, well, you know, you, sometimes you've got to kind of make a deal with the devil on that. Is there a way to straddle that line more and weed out some to bring in the ones you really want? Well, I don't. I agree with you, Rob, that you don't want to get in the business of sort of the government's jobs not to invest uh, in, in you know companies or be a venture capital firm, if you will. Uh, the job, I, I believe, at best for the government is to increase, uh, if we can, economic activity by by sort of broadening and creating a better environment. We were talking about tax relief. That's one piece of it, obviously. Um, are there ways that we can sort of partner with communities uh, when other businesses are sort of involved in that discussion? I think so, as long as we're not, again, as long as the government's not picking winners and losers. I and mean, this is a situation you look at, you know, Procter & Gamble and Clorox, those, some of those really big hits that have happened in the eastern panhandle. I mean, those discussions were obviously happening, happening on, the, uh, on the government level as well. So, uh, you know, I don't think this is sort of the state going out and saying yes here, no here. These are opportunities that are coming in. These are people that are saying we want to be in West Virginia. Um, can you sort of help us get to West Virginia? And and somebody had mentioned on the, the floor on Friday that this is, as you as you point out, this is sort of the, the nature of competition as we know it uh, in, in neighboring states. Uh, we've seen a huge investment in Ohio in a manufacturing facility over there. Uh, so we, what we don't want to do is put ourselves in a position where we're not competitive. We have to be in the game. And, and that is the issue right there, Moore, because if you're not, then that job goes someplace else. That's right. And I think what people want at the end of the day is a good paying job. I mean, that's the best that we can do for any West Virginian. I think there's also a tendency among the naysayers to look at this from a, like a static analysis instead of a dynamic analysis, where in a, in a perfect world, the money that the state invests into a company is brought back many fold by the presence of, of new people and the support industries that come and, and support the people. Uh, my question to you, I mean, 750 jobs, that's, that's a big number. And uh, how confident are we that those are real positions that would actually happen as opposed to, well, let's pick a number and say we're going to have 750 jobs? I think that, uh, you know, all of these things are sort of forecasted out. Uh, I, I believe that the company submitted pretty um, pretty robust and complex numbers on how they got there on payroll and on and number of employees. But you bring up a good point that the, the broader economic impact of this economic activity is going to have an impact outside of direct jobs. You talk about construction jobs and then you have to have more folks that are in town. You know, it's going to be better for Di places that are dining or hotels where people are coming in to visit for business meetings. So all of these ancillary industries certainly derive a benefit from such a massive investment. How would you summarize the opposition to this? What was, what was the central theme of the folks who were against the investment? I think it was a, you know, I think largely the debate centered around uh, whether you know, we felt that uh, it, what was a little bit disconcerting for me was that it, 
At one point, it sounded like it was a little bit regional, and I think it, what's really, really important in the state of West Virginia is that we encourage all parts of West Virginia to, to grow. And I'm not saying that, that, that anybody, but there was somebody that was in favor was suggesting that. I said, well, I don't, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. But, uh, you know, a lot of the opposition was some of the concerns that, that you brought up. Are, are, you know, how firm are these numbers? How sure are we that they're going to follow through uh, with the, the investment as they say they are? And, and you know what? I think those are all legitimate, good questions to ask, speak, ask because it raises our level of awareness. It ensures that we're paying attention to what the company's doing. They're following through and meeting the markers and hitting the triggers. So, I, I, you know, all of these pieces, I, I think the discussion, um, while, you know, it was long, uh, I think it was productive because we'll know how, how we want to view this project and how we want to view projects going down the road. Let's talk about something that seems to be of concern to the Senate more. And as Judiciary Chair, I'd like to know if it's of equal concern to you as they brought up an issue with how the governor used his discretionary funds to divert money to Marshall University to build a baseball stadium there. The Senate, at least in the form of Eric Tarr and Craig Blair, respectively the finance chair and the Senate president, seem to think this is a pretty big deal. Is it a big deal to the Judiciary Chair in the House? I think that these conversations will continue to occur. I, I don't think we can make much of an argument that the governor did a tremendous job leading this state through uh, a, a very difficult time. There was a there were lots of uh, payments that were, I believe, you know, going out before any of these assistance payments came through. And my understanding is that these were sort of reimbursements into the state. Um, you know that's a that's sort of a, a question that the I think that the that the, uh, the the governor staff and the and the Senate are going to have to sort of settle on. But at the end of the day, it's like tax relief, or just like you know investing in uh, you know a new uh, promising situation in in, in the Northern Panhandle. Uh, we got to come together on this because um, uh, we always want oversight. Um, it, you know what is incredibly important in state government without question is transparency. So obviously we need to see uh, that things were handled in a transparent manner. And I think um, once we do, I think it'll be very evident uh, the answer to your question. I think the reason why getting the temperature of the room in the House is important is because the Senate and the governor have a relationship that is strained and at times very unfriendly. And so when the Senate says they're concerned about something the governor did, I think you take that with a grain of salt and say, well, that's just the two picking at each other. The House right now seems to have a great relationship with the governor. So if this is of concern to the House, I think it carries an equal or maybe greater amount of weight than the Senate's concern. I think that that's an interesting point. It's, uh, you know, I've been down here uh, a few terms and I've noticed that, uh, you know, it's, it's always uh, two out of the three that are usually uh, uh, playing in the sandbox nicely. Uh, and I say that somewhat jokingly because we're, you know, we're all, you know, we've got super majorities in both house and we've got a Republican in the governor's office. So, um, you know, there's debate on how things are done. But, um, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think this is something that we have to keep our eye on. Um, but. Uh, it seems to me from the from some of the testimony that I've heard uh, that you know the, the, these were the way that the flow the flow of funds were um, uh, not inappropriate. But again, I think it's important to ensure that we have full transparency on it, so that the people of West Virginia can see all of these things. By the way, Speaker Pro Tem Delegate Paul Espinosa texted me during our conversation here more and talking about the form energy investment. Uh, Paul says that uh, the study through the John Chambers College of Business and Economics Bureau of Business and Economic Research prepared a briefing paper to estimate the potential economic impact of the proposed form energy project. And they concluded that by 2029, the $290 million incentive West Virginia is kicking in is estimated to generate an annual economic impact of more than $2.1 billion. That's annual That's right. for an economically That's distressed right. area of our state that desperately needs economic development. And I think right. that vote was 69-25 in the House 
on Friday, by the way, in, in favor of making that uh, that investment. Uh, more, a couple minutes left. Uh, what's on your mind? Anything that you want to make sure our, our audience knows about? Uh, absolutely. We are uh, working hard down here on, um, you know, education's got to be a huge priority of something to, to take a, a better look at. We want, we want to ensure that we're getting our uh, parents as involved in their children's education as we can. We know that uh, that uh, the more that parents are involved, uh, the better. Unfortunately, in the state of West Virginia, not all parents are involved. So how are we creating sort of the supplemental resources that are needed in the classroom to improve uh, outcomes? Where We've got a, a bill for that to, to provide sort of in those early years for our kids to make sure that they're staying up to speed and reading and math uh, to try to get that assistance in the classroom because again all of the markers show us that if if our kids are are reading uh you know and 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 hitting those math markers at the right times the outcomes are incredibly uh increased the bill that i'm working on right now uh is a bill that relates to uh farmland this is one of my my bills uh what was shocking to me to learn uh this trend over the past year is that Within the next, you know, four, three to five years, the you know the United States of America is actually going to import more food than it exports, which is uh, which is troubling. I think it's you know, not only should we be, you know, as a practical matter, we're a farming community here in West Virginia. Uh, we're a farming country, so why in the world would we be importing more food than we're exporting? And what we know is that foreign countries like China are coming into places like uh, West Virginia that have farms, and they're trying to buy up this farmland and put our farmers uh, out of business. So, again, they, so the import-export uh, scales can be even more tilted. So I've got a bill that would prohibit uh, foreign countries like China from coming in and buying uh, West Virginia farmland to ensure that uh, we're creating the food uh, for, for the country because – at the end of the day, when you look at it, it's a national security issue for food security and food supply. Uh, we don't often think about it, but I think it's incredibly important. Another piece that I'm very, very passionate about and I've always been passionate about is how do we grow our small businesses and entrepreneurship community in West Virginia? And I've got a bill that will help to dedicate uh, a certain amount of contracts and um, sort of when we look at what we're doing from an economic development perspective, make sure that we're not just looking at the big companies here and ensure that we're looking to those risk takers, those entrepreneurs and those small businesses, and we're investing equally uh, in them. Because we know in West Virginia, our economy is driven by small business. So this will help to shine a light on the important work that small businesses do give them some tax relief in those first uh, few years, potentially, that they're in existence um, so, they can, so they can be the seeds that ultimately grow and, and create lots of jobs in, in the communities that we value very much. Good stuff. More appreciate you taking some time to be with us on the program this morning. Hey, thanks, Rob. Anytime. Love to come back. Thank you, sir. We'll have you back for certain.